You're listening to the Redemption Church Podcast with Pastor Daniel Williams as we go through a series called Rhythms of Grace. If I have not met you, my name is Pastor Daniel. I'm so excited to be continually uh, teaching the Bible and studying this series of grace. And we've been in this season of teaching ourselves, our minds, what does grace look like in our lives? We focused on work and how work actually is a gift from God. Uh, He's given us gifts and abilities to build the church, to edify one another, but also to go into our world and to display that grace and that beauty of his mercy and love to other people. Uh, And then because we work, we get finances, and that's a gift from God and a grace of God to be able to excel in giving and bless people, uh, not only our family and our friends, but our neighbors and loving people through that grace of being good stewards. And so we're sort of talking about faith. We're talking about work and what are the implications of that. And obviously it's easy to say, well, you know, I got a big raise. That's, That's grace, the grace of God, a gift of God. Okay, great. When things are high, it's pretty easy to say, oh, the grace of God. But what about those things that are low or those things that that may go against culture? And so we're talking about work and we're talking about money and we're talking about real life and parenting and family and all this different stuff. And and you have to come to this conclusion that there there's grace in all. James 1.17 says he is the giver of all good gifts. And one thing that he gives us, God himself, is rest. And so the next thing that we're sort of focusing on uh, in this series is Sabbath, a Sabbath. A 24-hour block of period to rest, to trust that we are not God and He is. And what does that look like? What does the Bible teach? And so if you have your Bible, turn to Exodus. Exodus uh, chapter 16. It's in the very beginning of your Bible. There's Genesis. There's Exodus. If you need a Bible, you can raise your hand. We'll give you a Bible. And if we have given you a Bible, it's I think it's page 58 in the Bible we gave you. Um, And so uh, just so we're on the same page, this is a great definition. There's many definitions of the Sabbath, but this is one by um, Pete Scarazzo. Uh, Scarazzo. He says, Sabbath is a 24-hour block of time in which we stop work, we enjoy rest, we practice delight, and contemplate God. The Sabbath is so much more than just a day off, and you're going to hear me be saying this over and over and over again, that God is actually placed in a weekly rhythm of our lives to rest, to stop, to contemplate, and to even just enjoy His grace. That we're delighting in God and just enjoying His grace. And so I want you to understand the Sabbath just isn't a law. It isn't just a rule. As last week we looked at Exodus chapter 20, where God gave His nation Israel commandments and said, hey, you should do this. Don't, don't worship other gods. Don't Say, to take my name in vain, uh, honor your mother and father, don't have adultery, don't commit uh, murder, all these different things. We would say, yes, 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 yes. But there's this fourth law that God gave this nation that they would be guided so that other people would see them under the lordship of Yahweh, God, and they would actually bless the nations. It's called the Sabbath, to rest, to have a holy day. And so We're going to look at Exodus 16, and this for two reasons. One reason is 16 comes before 20. That's math. You guys all know that, right? Many times we talk about the law. We last week was the Sabbath, a restful rule, and a rule is not what God is getting at. He's giving us this rule to bless us. It's grace, and so I want you to see the first time the Sabbath was actually practiced and commanded by God, and it was something that's not just this rule-based bound thing, but it's actually an opportunity to worship God. And it's found in Exodus chapter 16, and so today uh, we're going to look at how the Sabbath is an amazing opportunity to party, to enjoy grace, and we have to do some prep work to do that. The Sabbath, preparing for a party, this awesome opportunity. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to read this long section of Scripture, I think you can handle it because you are all adults. Some of you look smarter than others, but I think we can do this, okay? We're going to read 30 verses. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this story and I'm going to read it to you. I'm going to give you some context as we go. I'm not going to have it all up on the screen, so that's why I'm wanting you to turn to your Bible. You could read along with me. Uh, Even if you don't have a different translation, it will somewhat be able to go. And we're going to sort of look at this story. Many times as, as Christians, we don't look at the whole narrative, the whole story. So I just want to read this to you and draw out points for you to understand and know. And so we'll read it, and then we'll pray, and then we'll study. What does that look like, the Sabbath? Taking a break to rest, 
to stop work, to enjoy God, to delight in Him, to enjoy His grace, to contemplate who He is. Um, And so we'll give you context as we go. Let's start in verse 1, chapter 16. They set out from Elam, and the congregation of the people of Israel came from the wilderness of sin. Now, the Israelites were leaving Egypt. They got delivered by God, okay? And it was between Elam and Sinai, and the 15th day of the second uh, month after they had departed from the land of Egypt. I love how the Bible gives us details as well, like what day, what month, history, archive, like all this stuff actually happened. So when we go into the story, don't just think, oh, that's a made-up fable. This is actually real. And remember, Israel had been free from slavery, leaving, leaving Egypt. And verse 2, the whole nation, the congregation of the people of Israel grumbled. They complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the people of Israel said to them, would that he had died, uh, would that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the meat pots and ate bread to the full, for you have brought us out into the wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Um, things weren't going really well with the nation, right? They were hungry. Now, it's really weird because they just got delivered, but notice they're very quick to forget the things of God, and they're saying, I wish we were even back in Israel because at least we can eat some bread and have some meat pots there. And so they were literally complaining to God who made them. Does that sound like any of you at one point, right? We were so easily to forget the grace of God, the goodness of God, but yet we complain, we grumble, and they even wanted to go back into slavery. That's how crazy this sin was. So, Verse 4, the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I am about to rain bread from heaven. He's about to make it rain. How awesome is that? He says, I'm going to make it rain bread from heaven for you. And the people shall go out and gather a day's portion every day that I may test them whether they will walk in my law or not. Now on the sixth day, when they prepare what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather daily. And so, so God's going to give them some guidelines on how to gather food and do this uh, thing called gathering bread. He said, I will do the miracle, but you have to go do the work to pick it up. And this this bread from heaven, we're going to find out in the story, is called mammon. Mammon actually, uh, or not mammon, manna. Manna actually means, what is it? They were confused. Like, it just appeared? It's a miracle? Manna? Okay, so verse 6. So Moses and Aaron said to all the people of Israel, At evening, you shall know that it is the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt. In the morning, you shall see the glory of the Lord. God's going to display his power to the people because he has heard your grumbling against the Lord. For what we are that you grumble against us. And Moses said, when the Lord gives you in the evening meat to eat and in the morning bread to be full, because the Lord has heard your grumbling that you grumble against him, What are we? Your grumbling is not against us, but against the Lord. God's about to show up in some power to prove himself that he is God. In verse 9, then Moses said to Aaron, remember Moses and Aaron are co-leaders there. Moses is using Aaron to speak to the people. And he says, say to the whole congregation of the people of Israel, come near before the Lord and for he has heard your grumbling. And notice he doesn't say, and he's about to kill you, because they actually did complain to the Lord, and he, God is a gracious God. He's a merciful God. So rather than just wiping them out, he's actually going to answer their prayer. He's going to meet that need. And in verse 10, as soon as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the people of Israel, they looked toward the wilderness, and behold, behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. And the Lord said to Moses, I have heard the grumbling of the people of Israel. Say to them, at twilight you shall eat meat. In the morning you shall be filled with bread, and then you shall know that I am the Lord your God. Why do we celebrate even Easter and are so excited about that as Christians? Because it proves what God says goes. God displays his power, his glory to his people because he wants relationship. He wants them to follow him. And so Jesus would also die, but he would rise again. He would tell that to us so that he can forgive our sins. God, over and over in the scriptures, demonstrates his glory, his power to his people. And so, God hears their prayers as he hears our prayers. He gives mercy as he gives mercy today, and he is gracious. Now, in verse 13, in the evening, quail came up and covered the camp. In the morning, dew laid around the camp. 
And when the dew had gone up, there was on the face of the wilderness a fine flake-like thing, fine as frost on the ground. When the people of Israel saw it, they said to one another, What is it? That's literally the translation, manna. For they did not know what it was. And Moses said to them, It is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. This is what the Lord has commanded. Gather of it, each of you, as much as you can eat. Now listen, God is about to provide for their need with bread from heaven. He still does that. Jesus said, I am the bread of of life. You have a need, you have sin. Well, guess what? I'm going to come down and provide bread from heaven, but you must receive it. You must gather. You must come to me. Jesus said, oh, come to me. If you believe, you receive this grace. And so they have to take God's word. God would provide for their need, and he would provide his, his, his miraculous miracle, his provision would be sufficient. Did you know that Jesus is sufficient? Think about it. They say, just take as much as you want. Just eat. Be satisfied. Be completely satisfied. You can be completely satisfied when God provides for your needs. And so, for they did not know what it was, verse 16, this is what the Lord commanded. Gather it, each one of you, as much as he can eat. You shall eat and take an omer. An omer is like two quarts or two liters, the translations say, according to the number of persons that each one of you has in his tent. So think about this. The amount would be different, but it would be enough for all people to be satisfied. It was sufficient. If you had two people in your household, you would take probably four liters. If you had eight people in your household, you'd take 16 liters. But at the end of the day, everyone would be satisfied by this miraculous miracle that God is providing for them to prove to them that he is God. And the people of Israel did so, verse 17. They gathered some more, some less, because they were different sizes, different families. But in verse 18, when they had measured an omer, Whoever gathered much had nothing left over, and whoever gained little had no lack. Each of them gathered as much as he could eat. And Moses said to them, Let no one leave any of it over till the morning. But they did not listen to Moses. Some left part of it till the morning, and uh, it bred worms and stank. I love that. It just stank. Disobedience always stinks, man. And Moses was angry with them. See what happens when you don't listen? It, it's, not, it's not the best. It's always best when we obey God. In verse 21, morning by morning they gathered each much as he could eat. But when the sun grew hot, it melted. This was an incredible thing that didn't just happen once. It was a daily system. This, think about it. Picture it in your story. You're hungry. You're complaining against God who is holy. And rather than him wiping out, he shows grace. He gives you, he provides sufficiently for everyone in the nation. Just that's a miracle. But then it comes down, it melts away, and you're like, wow, that was incredible. All right, moving on with my life. Nope, next day I'm going to do it. Nope, next day. It started to become a system, a daily process. What was the reason why this was happening? Because it was an opportunity to test their faith so they can trust God. God was doing a miracle so they would trust him every single day and be overwhelmed by his goodness, by his grace, every single day. How many times do we have to be reminded that God's grace is for us every single day? The breath that we have, the the sufficiency, the grace that he gives us, it is of him for us to be people of thanks, understanding and trusting who he is every single day. This is the system that God has given us, an opportunity for faith. Well, on verse 22, on the sixth day, this is day one, day two, day three, day four, day five. Okay, now the sixth day is coming. They gathered twice as much bread, two omers each. And when all the leaders of the congregation came and told Moses, he said to them, this is what the Lord has commanded. Tomorrow is a day of solemn rest, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. This is the first time Sabbath is mentioned to the nation of Israel. Bake what you will bake and boil what you will boil, and all that is left over will lay aside, but be kept till the morning. So they laid it aside till the morning as Moses commanded them, and it did not shrink, uh, not shrink, it did not stink, and there were no worms in it. So if they kept it during day one, day two, day three, day four, day five, it, it would stink, it would get rotten. They had to do that work every day, but on the seventh day, something different happened. God put in a system to actually have them work Uh, six days, and on the seventh day he would rest, but they would always have this manna, this miracle, this faith, but they would have to prepare for it. They would have to gather double the amount on the other day so they can enjoy that day seven of solemn 
rest. Now, verse 27, you guys are doing so great. We're reading the Bible together. This is amazing. On the seventh day, some of the people went out to gather. Now, they just had instruction not to do this, but yet they're disobeying again. It's like they literally are experiencing a miracle day after day after day, and, not, and, tr- and now they're not going to trust God. This is like all of us. But they found none. And the Lord said to Moses, How long will you refuse to keep my commandments and my laws? See, the Lord has given you the Sabbath, the day of rest, the holy day. Therefore, on the sixth day, he gives you bread for two days. Remain each of you in his place. Let no one go out of his place on the seventh day. So the people rested on the seventh day. And so we see this nation of Israel practice a Sabbath that would test and strengthen their faith, that would give them rest for their bodies while they do it. And this would be the first time the nation of Israel practiced the Sabbath. And this would be the first time the Sabbath word is mentioned for the people to observe. Now, there's a lot in from it. I'm not going to go all over it, but I think it will be important to study it, to apply it to our hearts. So let's pray and ask God to speak to us. Jesus, we thank you that we can come to your word. And we know that that was a lot. Lord, how powerful is that, Lord, that we could just come and read your word and know who you are and learn your character. And I even pray, God, that you would instill that in our lives as we continue with our reading plan and studying your word day after day, trusting you day after day. Uh, But we know it's special right now, Lord, to come together and to study it. And so we pray, God, that you would speak to us, that Holy Spirit, you would speak through me, that you would teach your people who you are as we look through the lens of this text, of your character, of your nature, of your goodness. Thank you so much, Lord, that you desire to pour out your grace upon us. I pray, Lord, that we would instill a Sabbath rest in our own lives, in our hearts, as we look to your word and what you say about our lives, how it should go. It's in your precious name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Now, when we talk about the Sabbath, here's the first thing I want you to understand. The Sabbath is a spiritual discipline. The Sabbath is a spiritual discipline. A spiritual discipline implies that it does not save you, but it is an important thing or a system, a process that you do to build your faith. Many times when people get saved or you want to grow in your faith, we actually walk you people through a book called uh, Spiritual Disciplines for the Christian Life by Donald Whitney. It's a great book. If you don't have it, we can make sure that we give you one. And it talks about different disciplines like fasting, praying, reading the Bible, um, silence and solitude. Sabbath is one of those things. And in that book, Donald Whitney says this, The people of God do not serve God in order to be forgiven, but because we are forgiven. These people had already been saved, and now God is going to guide them to continue to bless them. They didn't have to do this to be saved, but it was foolish if they didn't obey because they didn't receive the bread. And we have to come to this approach to God's word. And when he gives us a command, he gives us this command for our good. It's important to see the Sabbath this way. We practice spiritual disciplines not to be saved, but because we are saved. We want to we discipline ourselves to be godly, to live for Jesus because he saved us, because we love us, because uh, we love him. In John 14, 15, Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commands. And we see this in the discipleship process as even the Apostle Paul was making disciples and his young apprentice, Timothy, in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7 through 8, he would tell Timothy, have nothing to do with irreverent, silly myths, but rather train yourself for godliness. For while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way. It holds promise to the present life and also for the life to come. As believers, we want to please God. We want to obey him. Not because we have to, but because we get to. We want to train ourselves. We want to train ourselves to walk in his ways and to follow his word. And it values our life right now, but for all eternity. We desire to be godly because we love Jesus and want to be like him. It's a loving relationship that we have with God through faith. We're saved by faith. We're saved by grace through faith. Donald Whitney would continue to go on in that book, and he would say, in my own pastor, pastoral and personal experience, my Christian experience, I would say that I've never known a man or a woman who came to spiritual maturity except through discipline. Godliness comes through discipline. And so as we Sabbath, we're investing in our faith because it's a discipline where we obey God out of worship, out of worship. God tells us to do it for our benefit, and so now we have an opportunity to follow his ways. We're empowered by his spirit and to ask for him to do these things in our life. This is why God gave the Israelites 
this Sabbath. It was an opportunity. You remember he said in verse 4 and 5, Behold, I am about to rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a day's portion, that I may test them, whether they walk in my law or not. And on the sixth day, when they prepare what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather. God was going to allow them to be tested in their faith to live out there. It was an opportunity. And you know what? Some obeyed, some didn't. Some were blessed, some weren't. But they had to choose. See, God provided the miraculous and the falling of bread from heaven. See, the ravens, okay, that could be a coincidence. Or the, the, not the ravens, but the quail. Okay, maybe, maybe, maybe that's, that's like the common grace, we would say. But bread from heaven just coming and appearing and then at the end of the night, like dissolving, that's pretty miraculous can't get around that. That's pretty incredible. But, but he still allowed people to do their part, faith. Did you know that the same is true today with the gospel? God does the miraculous. Jesus died and rose again for our sins, but he still allows us to trust in that word, to have faith. Trust him, to know his grace and opportunity So God is giving them grace, allowing them to obey, or to not, allowing them to practice faith because it happened day after day after day. And we, if you know the story and you read on, it's going to happen more than just a week. It's going to happen for multiple years. And we are to live our Christian walk from faith to faith. And so the Sabbath takes faith, like any other spiritual discipline. Practicing a Sabbath day takes faith. The Bible says it's impossible to please God without faith. When I Sabbath, I trust that God is who he is and I am not. That my identity is not in all that I can do, but I have to rest and trust that he is sovereign and he is in control. And in our society in America, where we're workaholics and we reward going above and beyond and just pushing and working and working and working and always, always going and going and going, it's hard for us to understand this. And this is why it takes faith. But you have to understand, it would be hard for them to understand this as well, even more so. Because they were like from an agricultural society, farming. So literally, there are verses in the Bible, if you do not work, you do not eat. They had to like trust, I'm going to have to take a day off and I can't like mine the field and and do these different things. I'm going to have to trust God so much so like with my life. That's probably the point. He wanted them to know that he was God with their lives. That it wasn't just a religious system, but there was a person behind this miraculous thing happening. And listen, taking a Sabbath can be hard because not only do you want to just work, 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 and and our culture feeds that, but also sometimes our spirit and our souls feed that as well. Because when I relax, I have to slow down and I have to process. Remember, taking a 24-hour time to contemplate God to be a people of things, to say, God has done this in my life, and and what are the mistakes, and how can I confess and and repent of these things? See, sometimes we like working because we want to prove ourselves, but sometimes we like working to distract ourselves. Sometimes we like giving rather than receiving, and when you stop working, you're not producing anymore. You're being. That's what we call us human beings, and when we just stop we realize we're not that great. We're not that perfect. We're not amazing. And that's a beautiful thing, and we need that. Because in those moments, God tells us he still loves us. That we don't have to be totally perfect for him to love us. That while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He cares for us. And there is an epidemic and a problem in our culture today where you can read studies about um, dopamine and how we run off adrenaline. There's a lot of studies with CEOs that can't stop work and uh, workaholics and and we struggle this in our society because we reward those things but God is saying slow down I want you to actually enjoy the grace of the life that I gave you sure six days you're going to build a life and you're going to produce but on the seventh day it goes back to creation God rested he enjoyed what he made oftentimes God is actually pouring out grace like in our family but we don't even take stop, stop to like enjoy that grace. And this is a great system. Remember, if God commands something and tells us something, it's for our good to bring him glory. And so practicing a Sabbath for us has to take, 
has to happen, but it has to happen through faith. And it will take you faith to practice a Sabbath, to stop one day a week and just to obey and to enjoy this opportunity. In verses 27 through 30, this end of this chapter, it says, On the seventh day, some of the people went out to gather, but they found none. They chose to work. You realize that? Like even after all the miracles, even after experiencing God, they still chose to work. You can still experience God and disobey him. And the Lord said to Moses, how long will you refuse to keep my commandments and my laws? See, the Lord has given you the Sabbath. I've given you, I've graced you this. I'm a giver of all good gifts. I'm giving you this opportunity to actually have double amount of uh, bread, to still be provided for, but to just stop physically, enjoy the grace, enjoy rest. Remain each of you in this, whole, in this place. Let no one go out of his place on the seventh day. So the people rested on the seventh day. We have an opportunity to practice our faith by taking a Sabbath. But if the Sabbath takes faith, then it also means it will take work. Because the Bible says that our faith produces work. And a lot of people miss, have this misunderstanding that we don't ever do works. No, the Bible says that we actually are saved unto works. We are not saved by works. It is by grace that you've been saved, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. But verse 10, actually God has ordained, predestined that we would walk in some good works. Titus would be reminded, tell, Paul would tell Titus, a pastor, to tell a congregation of churches, remind them that they are to do good works because James would say your faith has works. God has made you for a great purpose. He's given you gifts, abilities, times, talents, treasures, and he wants you to bring him glory and to do great things for his kingdom. Work is not the enemy. Work is not bad. You are actually told to work, but to do good works, trusting in God and following his spirit where he tells you to go. And so if the Sabbath is going to take faith for us to trust in what God says, it's going to take us work as well because our faith has works and it's good for us to do good works, to pursue righteousness, to pursue holiness, to actually have effort in following God. 2 Timothy 2, 20 through 22 says, Now in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also wood and clay, some of honorable use, some of dishonorable use. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, he will be a vessel for honorable use, set apart as holy, useful to the master of the house, ready for every good work. So flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, pursue love, pursue faith and peace, along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. I want to be an honorable vessel, don't you? I want to worship God. I want to give my life to him and serve him and to, to pursue love and to pursue righteousness and to pursue holiness. We can't just say, well, God's sovereign. I'm just going to take care of it. No, we have a free will and we're to apply the word of God to our life. Jesus says when we do it, it takes faith, but you don't have to do anything. He gives you some choice as well. And so when we talk about spiritual disciplines and even practicing the Sabbath, it's going to take some effort and hustle and, and, and some things on your part to go after it. Donald Whitney, again, in another book, which I haven't read, but I'm, I'm interested in it because I saw this quote, and I'm like, huh, I didn't know he wrote this. But he's sort of a guy in spiritual formation, just like a, a, um, a, well, a lot of great guys and Christian godly people are. But um, in this book, Simplify Your Spiritual Life, Spiritual Disciplines for the Overwhelmed, he says, no one coast into Christ-likeness. Any progress, uh, any progress in godliness requires spirit-filled effort and purpose. He goes on and says another quote, from biblical times to our time, godly people have always been spiritually dis disciplined people. Godliness requires discipline, worship. Are you disciplined? Are you putting your faith to work? Are you, that's why we say, are you practicing a Sabbath? It takes practice. It takes work. It takes effort. And Exodus 16 Verse 23, God actually tells them to take work to practice the Sabbath, to prepare. If you look at that verse and the sort of the section of it, when God starts implementing that and then tells them about the sixth day, he says, this is what the Lord has commanded. Tomorrow is a day of solemn rest, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. Bake what you will bake and boil what you will boil. All that is left over lay aside to be kept 
till the morning. Gather double. Bake today so you can have rest tomorrow. Prepare. It says to prepare so you can have solemn rest. Solemn means a formal or dignified thing. It means seriousness. It's a, it's a dignified rest. It's a seriousness rest. God takes his people finding rest seriously. That's what this text is saying. And in order for us to take it seriously, we're going to have to prepare for this day of rest. It's not just going to happen. We have to practice it. So he says, gather all the manner, prepare for it, so you can enjoy the Sabbath day. And let me, let me encourage you guys, okay? I just, this is probably, you probably wouldn't get this point from this text, but I just want you to know because I think so many people have different views of the Sabbath. The party is coming. The party is coming. H- have you ever had an amazing meal? Or, you know, today is a holiday. You know where we get holidays from? It's called holy. It's a holy day. The Sabbath is a holy day, a holiday, something to celebrate, to enjoy, to delight in. You know how you get excited about Christmas? You get, just, it just get these gifts and be with family and friends. The party is coming. The Bible actually says that heaven is real. We're going to enjoy God's grace and have feast and perfect, complete rest. And today he wants to give us this foretaste, a preview of that by every single day in our normal lives, a week, relying on his grace and enjoying his grace and saying, I'm going to give you a holy day. You only have to work six days, but seventh day, here's a little preview. Give you a little hope. It's called a Sabbath. You can delight in me. You can delight in the grace I've given you and enjoy beauty and creation and, and these type of things because, because this, is, this is my heart for you. Listen, the Israelites had to gather double and we may have to pay bills during the week. We may have to do other things to prepare to take one day off, but it's worth it. It's worth it because the Sabbath day is supposed to be a delight. It's like prepping for a party. It's like prepping for a party. It's important to understand that we celebrate the Sabbath. We celebrate God's grace, that it's a delight, it's beauty. This rule was not to be a killjoy. Y'all know what I'm talking about, right? Because a lot of people think, well, God just gives us rules a killjoy because I can never do it. No, God actually gave this so that they can party. There are many festivals in the Old Testament of this nation. They can have a holy day. Jesus came on the scene. He, he gave this example. He, he says in John 16, 21, When a woman is giving birth, she has sorrow because her hour has come. All the women say amen to that. But when she has delivered the baby, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a human being has been born unto the world. Listen, preparing actually does take work, but it's nothing to actually the goodness of the actual thing you're preparing for. And many times people don't want to practice God's ways because they have a messed up view of God's grace like it's not good. He's the father of all good gifts. So last example for you, just before I move on, little final point. It's like the difference of if you're prepping for a test or if you're prepping to go to Walt Disney World. See, I have a nine-year-old and a 12-year-old, okay? And they prep and they prepare differently for a test, like begrudgingly, terrible, I don't want to do this, this stinks, this is horrible, blah, who likes school? But they sure are delighted and start prepping way in advance to go to Walt Disney World, don't they? Because then they, oh man, it's not no school, I gotta hang out, we get rides, it's a delight, it's amazing. That's the difference, my friends. There is rest for us, there is delight, there is grace, and we are so busy, we're so caught up trying to prove ourselves, and God's like, you don't have to prove yourself. I just want to give you grace. I want to give you rest. I want you to enjoy. I take this thing seriously. It's called a party. It's called grace. It's called delight. If you don't view the Sabbath as a joy, as a party, it will be hard for you to prepare. This is why we say a Sabbath is a 24-hour block of time in which we stop work. You don't work. You enjoy rest. You practice delight and contemplate God. This day is holy, it is blessed, and it is a great day, and it is worth our prepping for a party because the Sabbath is a good day, and it's good for us. God actually made it in our DNA, in creation, that we would trust him, and isn't that a good thing? When we don't practice Sabbath and we don't practice rest for our bodies, can I just tell you there's bad consequences? 
You may or may not heard of this man. His name is Randy Gardner. Anyone know who that is? No? Yeah, neither did I. But as I was doing some research and even talking to my son, he would bring up this story. He's learned this at school. Uh, he was born in 1948, uh, and he has the record holder for the longest human who has gone without sleep. Okay, so in 1964, Gardner was a high school student in San Diego, California, and he stayed awake for 264 hours, 0.4 hours, okay? Um, that's 11 days and 25 minutes without sleeping. Can you just imagine? You're just shaking your head like, I just want to nap right now. This is terrible. Yes, they did this as an experiment, and there was doctors under it, John uh, J. Ross, who actually monitored his health, and he reported serious cognitive and behavioral changes. This is included moodiness, problems with concentration, a short-term memory, paranoia, hallucinations, hallucinations. On the seventh or on the eleventh day, when he was asked to subtract seven repeatedly, um, starting at a hundred, he stopped at sixty-five. And when asked why he had stopped, he replied, I had forgot what I was doing. When we lack rest, sleep, neglect our body, there are serious consequences. I know this personally. For most pastors that get burnt out in ministry, the spiritual disciplines, they stop practicing and stop worshiping and don't take a day off, try to do too much, being like their God, and they end up burning out. Listen, God has given us limitations, and it is for our good. In verse 24 through 26, he says, So they laid it aside till the morning as Moses commanded them, and it did not stink. It didn't stink. You know, you can get so burnt out that Jesus becomes a burden to you. It stinks. The bread of man, this miracle happened, but they were so caught up in working and doing and doing and doing and doing, they forgot their identity and it actually affected the nutrition that they needed. And there was no worms in it when they rested, when they took time to enjoy the miraculous miracle and the gift that God gave. Moses said, eat it today, for today is a Sabbath to the Lord. Today you will not find it in the field. Six days you shall gather, but on the seventh day, which is the Sabbath, which is holy, there will be none. God set up limitations for the Israelites, and he set up limitations for you and for me to rest, to enjoy him, to have a Sabbath. Donald Whitney said, love God, and within the limitations he has sovereignly placed in your life, at this time, do what you can. Love God, do what you can. Let me give you some practical tips if you're wanting to implement a Sabbath. What does that even look like? This is something that I practice with. This is something that I do every week, uh, my family. But the first thing I think that you have to have is just have a biblical conviction. Listen, if you, if you think this is just a good idea and a, a pipe dream and it's something that you're coming up with, you're, you're not going to necessarily have the strength and reliance to do it because other pipe dreams and good ideas will come up. Other people's pipe dreams and good ideas will come up. But if you believe that God has put this in his word and for you to practice it and that you can obey this, that this is a worship issue, it will actually help you to guard, to prep, to fight, to actually take 24 hours to rest in God. Because this will be hard and it will be work, especially when you first start this practice. But then I would say, be very practical. I'm talking about pick a day. Schedule it out. Put it in your rhythm. You notice how it was every seventh day. One of the reasons I choose Monday is because it's very practical for me. Most people, I, I deal, because I'm a pastor, I deal with people. And so I love what I do. I love counseling and studying those type of things, but most people are very busy with work on Monday. They had a long weekend, so they get back to work. So that's probably the best time for me to take my day off because most of my work involves people and involves you. And most of you guys go to work, so I could actually take time, and that's probably the best day for me to take off. Plus, just physically, I'm very tired after Sunday with setting up, waking up early in the morning, prep. I don't know if you know this. This is like work for me the most best job ever, but it's still work. I got to tear down, and afterwards I do some other stuff, and sometimes I have night meetings. Like Sunday is a, is a work day for me, and, and so um, I chose to take Mondays off to be practical because I need to seek God. I need to enjoy fellowship. I need to have a day, and you know what? You get to seek God, and so I would say pick a day, and for most of us, it's probably going to be Sundays. 
There's a reason why the church has a weekly rhythm to it. Because Sundays is a good day to practice Sabbath because most, that's when most services are, and that's great. Because what are you supposed to do on a Sabbath? Well, you're supposed to seek God, worship Him, sing, be in fellowship, have laughter, enjoy other people. You get to do that at a service, don't you? You rest, you come, you get fed the Word. Sundays seem like a different day, almost like a holy day. It's, like a, a, it's different than just a day off. And so whether it be a Sunday, a Saturday, a middle of the week Wednesday, I would tell you to ch- choose a, a day rather than being like, oh, today's Tuesday and I'll, this week I'll do Wednesday and the next week I'll do a Friday. You'll get all messed up. It's good to just have that rhythm every seven days. The next thing I tell you to do is tell others to be accountable. Accountability helps us grow. That's why we want you in community groups to uh, hold each other up with loving accountability. I personally tell people, Mondays, I don't work. It's my day off. I take my Sabbath there. So people know. You all know in the church, Mondays, oh, he's not working. I'm going to call him on Tuesday. Or if I don't check my email or get back to you on a Monday, it's because I, I practice the Sabbath. I don't usually check my email. I usually don't do church work. And I've tried to help myself by telling other people, this is when I'm doing this. So they understand, so they know. The next thing I say is, if you have a Sabbath day and you've picked a day and you're telling other people, make some plans. I personally don't like just sitting around. Do you? Like, I'm type A, I'm, I'm an extrovert. I, I like, uh, the, sitting around sometimes doesn't replenish me. And if this was all the Sabbath was, is just sitting and staring at the sky, I probably wouldn't keep it every week. And some people get a skewed view of Sabbath. I, it's to enjoy God's grace. And so uh, do things that you enjoy. Have you ever thought about that? What are some things you, like, you love golf? Do you love the ocean? Do you love, like, what do you love to do? Do you know that I often go to movies with Laura on my Sabbath day? Because she just really loves theater and art and movies. So I'm like, great, I love being with you. It's perfect. We do things that we enjoy. So usually I sleep in, I take a nap. Um, I work out at the gym longer on Mondays. I go on dates with Laura. I spend time with family, invest in relationship, have friends over for dinner. Um, Things that Laura and I just enjoy doing. Um, I even will order a book and I usually read, like Laura loves sitting at the house doing nothing, so that's when I usually read a lot more because we're just sitting there. She's just relaxing and um, I like to read and so I'll read books the Bible more for a few hours, pray, just be there. But make some plans. Enjoy. Like, what, 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 what do you have to do? What, how do you have to do that? And, and that goes to my next point. You have to prepare. Because if you want to read a book tomorrow, well, you better Amazon Prime it this week to get it here before Monday. You know what I'm saying? If you want a great meal, then go to a store. Now, listen, I'm not saying that you can't go to the store on your Sabbath. Actually, did you guys know there's a new Publix just a mile away that opened up? I went there just for fun. Now, that may be dreary to you. That may be terrible to you. But I was just like, oh, this is a new public. I'm just going to go. Oftentimes, I actually mow my lawn on a Monday. You may say, well, you're not supposed to work. Well, guess what? That's not work for me. I, I sit in the office all day. Well, you guys are enjoying your life and on the beach. I'm like studying the screen, studying and praying and having meetings. I'm like, oh, it's sunny again. Oh, it's sunny again. So I want to go outside. So I mow my lawn. It's nothing like work. I can actually set aside an hour and get something done. It's amazing. Whereas, like, the stuff I do, it's all head work and knowledge and this and that, and you know, sometimes never see your fruit. So you got to understand, like, how are you going to prepare? Who are you going to invite over if you want to have people over? Are you going to buy the movie tickets? Are you going to uh, go and, like, what refreshes you? What preparations do you need to make that will refresh you in your Sabbath? And, and here's another one. Practice rest. This is a hard one. Let me just warn you. At first, this will be really hard for you to do really, really hard. When I mean by practicing rest, I literally mean putting your phone away and not checking email or text so your mind can get rest. So you can like think. You may even be bored for a little bit. What I mean by rest is like unplugging, allowing your brain to rest, practice silence and solitude, but also like take a nap. Don't feel guilty like just to sleep in. It's your Sabbath. Rest. You are spiritual, but you're also physical. So enjoy a nap. Take time for that. At first, I know I was, I was really bored and I struggled with this, but I'm just telling you, as you replenish your body physically, the Lord is able to just restore you spiritually. 
This is sort of a no-brainer, but it has to be said. Only a few more points, and we're going to close. But again, these are practical tips for you. Here's one. Worship Jesus on the Sabbath. How many times do I need to say the Sabbath is not just a day off? It's more than a day off. Luke 6, 5, Jesus said to them, the Son of Man is the Lord of the Sabbath. Let's not forget why we are practicing a day of rest to enjoy God, to contemplate Him, to enjoy His rest, to worship Him. This is why most people pick a Sunday for their Sabbath because they choose to worship God. I know that some of you are saying, well, we still tear down on, on, on Sunday. That's work. Well, you know what? Actually, that's worship, and it's okay to worship God on Sabbath. All right? We're not legalistic about, oh, with this and that and the other. We need to actually enjoy God and worship Him. And yes, enjoying God, worshiping God, actually may, may be a little bit of work like picking up your Bible and reading it a little bit more on a Sabbath. But that's what it's for. To, to understand Him, to know Him, to practice Him, to set the pace for your whole life. If you can't worship God on one day, it's going to be hard for you to implement that every single day. And so you should start by practicing that. You know, Psalm 92 is actually a song of the Sabbath, song for the Sabbath. There is scripture, having prayer walks, having fellowship with God. These things, we need to practice and, and implement those things in the Sabbath. It's not just a selfish day for us to indulge, but also one where we actually find our hope and satisfaction in Jesus. Lastly, be about a relationship, not just a rule. It's relational. I think our posture needs to be about pursuing Jesus, not just having a rule. And what I mean by that is there is grace in Jesus. Things come up. Okay? Uh, just two weeks ago, I was at a conference on a Monday. <gasps> so it was, oh, should I not go to this conference? Should I not? No, I knew it was coming. I still had a great meal, still enjoyed it. That's what I find good. Was it work? Sort of, yes. But then at nighttime, I still hung out with friends, did some things. Emergencies, pastoral emergencies especially. You know what? The hospital is still open on Mondays, my Sabbath. And you know what? I still sometimes answer my phone if there's an emergency and still will work and still things come up. But Jesus said, what is your posture? What is your heart? In Matthew 12, 11, he said to them, which one of you who has a sheep, if it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will not take hold of it and lift it out? It's not about a religious duty and a rule, but it's about a relationship that you're cultivating in the rhythm of your life that we should love God, that it's relational. Be strategic about seeking Jesus on the Sabbath, but it's not just a to-do list. Like it's often said, fasting without praying is just starving yourself. It's not a spiritual practice. If you just take a day off and don't seek God, it's not a spiritual practice. So what does that look like for you? Seek God, pray to God, it's relational. But I would say this, we have to prepare for the Sabbath. And the result of our preparation is actually enjoying the party, enjoying the rest of God, enjoying the mercy and grace and the blessing of God. Listen, the Israelites, they got double manna. They were blessed as they practiced the Sabbath. And as we practice the Sabbath, the Lord will bless us. Just like another spiritual discipline we talked about, like tithing. We give 10% to first honor the Lord, and He could do more with the 90% that we have than the 100% of us holding on. God could do more with the six days accomplishing greater works in your life. He doesn't need you to work all seven days. He doesn't want to just have you producing, producing, producing. He wants to minister to you to receive. And so we think we have less because we do less, but we actually have more and we're blessed by God and we enjoy his rest. God is the giver of all gifts, full of grace, He'll, he, he didn't wipe out those Israelites, even though he could have for complaining, but he actually provided manna, bread from heaven, for the Israelites to bless them, to give them life. And he does the same thing for us. God could have and should have just wiped, wiped us out for our sin. We're imperfect people. We do produce some things, and they're always not the perfect thing. They're always not glorious. Sometimes they're wicked, and they're evil, and that's in our heart. And there's a price to be paid. But God is gracious. He set for us the bread of heaven, Jesus. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven, Jesus says, and gives life to the world. And they said to him, Sir, give us bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. You see, practicing a Sabbath day, one day a week, won't truly give you rest and life. It's a good principle, 
And you're blessed when you apply, apply Jesus' principles like any spiritual discipline or command. But true salvation comes in Jesus. And so first we need to know him, worship him. Because Jesus actually, the Bible tells us, is our true Sabbath, our true rest. And so as we partake and enjoy Jesus every day like they did the manna, God tells us that he'll give us rest for our souls, rest to our bodies, that we can enjoy grace. And we find our true rest when we trust in God and follow him. And so, yes, it will take some faith, it will take some work, but Jesus is so worth it. Hear the heart of what a Sabbath is. A discipline is going to take faith for you to worship God. You have the opportunity to actually implement this in your life, to contemplate God, to enjoy rest, and give your body some time to process. As we worship Jesus, he will be sufficient enough for all of us. And so let's pray and let's remember how he gave his life so that we can have life it's by taking communion and receiving his grace. Jesus, we thank you so much that we can worship you. We thank you so much, Lord, that you are alive, that you are king, that what you say says go. And God, we just pray, Lord, as we talk about rest and talk about just the Sabbath, Lord, we don't want to be um, basing our lives off a rule to be better and try harder, but out of worship, God. And we know, Lord, that you've given us this opportunity to worship you. And so help us, Lord, build our faith. Help us to trust in you, not just in this, the spiritual discipline of, of the Sabbath, but also, God, in, in reading the word and praying and having fellowship. Uh, there are so many ways we can follow you, God. And so I pray your spirit will continue to guide us gently. Lord, may we be reminded and guided to your grace. And you told us as we gather together to remember your grace, that there is salvation in your name, that we are not saved by works, but it is your grace, that you died on the cross for our sins. And you rose three days later, so that way we can know you are coming back again and we will have ultimate fulfillment and rest in you. Help us to practice our identity now that we are children of God. For whoever believed in your name, you gave the right to become children of God. And now all spiritual blessings come in you. I pray, God, that if there's those that are listening or in this room or even online, Lord, that don't know you, God, that they would receive your grace, the true bread of life, that they would be satisfied, that they would see your mercy, that even though we complain, we sin, we grumble against you, God, you still love us. Help us in this room to receive your love today by enjoying the forgiveness of our sins, by confessing our sins to you, knowing that we don't have to be perfect. We could be imperfect people that trust you. And so we come to your throne again. We come to your altar. We, we receive these elements. We practice by faith, living out what we believe. And we just pray, Lord, that you would be the king of our lives, the Lord of the Sabbath, the Lord of everything, Lord. We love you, Jesus. We thank you so much for the sacrifice. I pray, Lord, that we would be able to come to you humbly to receive your grace. In your name we pray, God. Amen. This is Pastor Daniel Williams with Redemption Church. Thank you so much for listening to this message. You can subscribe to this podcast via iTunes, Google Play, or YouTube, so you never miss a message. The mission of Redemption Church is to pursue and to proclaim Jesus, and we would love to have you partner with us. Feel free to share these messages with your family and friends. And also, if you'd like to donate to the ministry, go to redemptiondb.com. God bless you.